Good morning. This is Anna Catterson, and welcome to the Teaching and Learning Commons. Today, we are talking about instructor presence and predominantly instructor presence in an online or hybrid classroom. All of these best practices and research that I'm sharing has been tried and true over the last 25 years of my involvement in higher education. And I hope today that I can share some examples, some real world examples in my own classes, as well as uh, sharing some additional research that you can use and hopefully some applications that you can practice in your own teaching craft. Um, there are five main strategies that we're going to focus on today. One of them is uh, recurring interactions, and I'm going to show you in Canvas how you can create recurring interactions. Um, number two, we're going to discuss uh, discussion forums and how to uh, get the most engagement out of discussion forums. Uh, we're currently doing a research survey right now at Heartland Community College, and our students uh, do enjoy discussions, but they are tired of the post once, reply twice, mundane discussions that most of us have gotten in the routine of. So I'm gonna share some ideas of how we can increase engagement through discussions. Number three is prompt feedback. And in Canvas, there are many ways that will help you uh, provide prompt feedback in, a, in various modalities. Number four, we're going to discuss real world connection. And the ultimate answer to the, why is this important statement that you might get, that motivational barrier can be found in the real world. We're finally in an age where the classroom and the real world can be easily connected. And creating this connection provides purpose and real-world application and engaging content into the online learning environment. And I'll share with you in Canvas of how you can make real-world connections and use some of the technology uh, that we have that can help with that. And then last, number five, is visual and audio communications. And online courses have come so far from their text-heavy correspondence beginnings I mean, just as in-person course gives the instructor a chance to express insights and connections in the concepts, technology tools have also made it possible for online students to share the same experience. Um, several years ago, I took an online course from the University of Wisconsin Stout, and the instructor showed us continuous presence. Um, Patrick Lowenthal, if you're interested, he uh, demonstrated uh, three types of instructor presence, social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And all three of those are equally important, but can be done many different ways. And I'm going to define and show you some examples of each of those. So let's get started. Let's first talk about recurring interactions. When we think of recurring interactions, the first thing that comes to mind is one of the most simplest ways, and that's through utilizing Canvas announcements. So let me take a second, share my screen, and talk just a few minutes about Canvas announcements. I'm in a sandbox course that I'm sharing, and if you haven't used our new templates, just wanted to do a plug for those. You can find those in Canvas Commons. We have new branding and there's a template for every division across Heartland. In addition, there's new policies and procedures and the 2023-2024 guidelines have also been shared. You can import those into any of your courses as you'd like. Now the landing page in all of our Canvas courses is the home page, And the home page will always show the last four announcements at the top of the screen. If you want to have more announcements be displayed, you can do that by going to settings at the bottom left-hand side. And under settings, if you scroll on down, there's an option that you can show. You click more options down here at the very bottom. You can choose how many number of announcements you want shown on the home page. 
Notice you can go all the way up to 15 if you'd like. So if you want more than four, you can certainly change that number under your settings. Also note, you have some other settings such as letting students attach files, let students reply, or you can disable comments on announcements down here at the bottom. So just note that there are some additional settings that you can change, uh, and it's all found under settings inside of your course. Now, let's go back up to the home page. All right, so to post an announcement, we're first going to need to go into the announcement section, which is the second item. Now you'll see that I have an eyeball here, and that means that I don't have any current announcements in my course. That's why it looks like um, it's not visible. If I go ahead and select announcements, we can see a few things. We can do a search at the top for all or unread. We can also type in the search box if there were quite a few announcements that we needed to add. And then also note, there's this option over here on the right called external feeds. If you want to add an RSS feed, you can certainly do that and it will post an announcement every time there is a new RSS feed post. And there's an additional feature called add external feed. And this is helpful if you're teaching, let's say a course that maybe has a news feed that may go along with it every day or every week, depending on how often those news feeds post new articles, you could share that full article or a, a truncated article uh, into your announcements page. And that can create a lot of instructor presence without you really having to do much of anything. Creating a hyperlink to course content through an RSS feed is a great way to keep your course relevant and current and students can see current news related stories or research that is focused on your content. So adding an RSS feed as an announcement will automatically post those announcements in your class without you having to do it uh, and will create some additional presence. Your students will feel as though you are making those posts without you really doing it. All right, let me close that out. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and add an announcement here and just wanted to talk through some of the features that um, Canvas allows. Um, we did, I did share with you that you can allow students to reply to class announcements. By default, they can. If you wanted to turn that off, however, you would want to um, make sure that this checkbox is deselected where it says allow users to comment. Let me zoom in there so you can see some of those settings. So if you want to allow users to comment to an announcement, you can create instructor presence and teaching presence in an announcement without much effort. Uh, you can also share that users must post before seeing replies. I always kind of discourage instructors from choosing this option. They feel as though um, in a face-to-face, -face, we wouldn't tell students not to speak until somebody else speaks first. So I, I usually don't recommend using that option because it prohibits students uh, from sharing. And so for an announcement, I would leave that off. In addition, you can also, let's come up here, uh, you can add video into an announcement to make it a little bit more engaging. Video announcements are a great way to connect with students. We do have Yuja embedded on the rich content editor, which is this up here. And if you select the rainbow wheel on the rich content editor, it will open up our Yuja media and allow you to do a quick recording, or you could choose a video that you've already recorded to put into an announcement. You could also choose a YouTube video. You can upload media and notice that you have several options. You can add your own video that maybe you recorded off your cell phone, maybe an audio file. You can upload a document or there's a link option that allows you to embed a YouTube or a Vimeo. To get the most engagement out of your instruction, it's better to embed videos rather than to link videos. And there is a difference. 
So for example, embedding would mean that we would actually locate, let me hop onto YouTube real quick. We would actually locate our um, video that we want to import. I'm going to go to my own channel, our online teaching and learning commons YouTube page. And here is a Yuja tutorial. So no matter um, what video you find, you grab this URL up here at the top and copy it. And then when we come back to Canvas into our Yuja editor, we can click on the link option, paste the YouTube link, and give it a title and a description. And then here's the import options. You can embed or you can import. If you select embed, the video will uh, get copied directly into the announcement. The user won't have to click on the link to open up YouTube. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits to that. By putting the video as an embedded video into an announcement, the student can watch the video where learning happens inside of the Canvas class. If we uh, create the import uh, or a, just a regular hyperlink without using the Yuja Media option, students would have to click on the link and it would open up YouTube outside of Canvas. So we always uh, recommend that we embed the YouTube link into the announcement or a Canvas page or a discussion. So that way the video will live with inside of Canvas rather than taking them outside of Canvas. All right, so let me just show that process one more time in case you missed it. I'm going up to the Yuja Media option and there is a link for upload media. I'm gonna choose the link and then select YouTube. Paste in that link. I'm going to embed it, give it a title and a description. And then start the upload. And that process will take just a few minutes to embed. Um, and I'm not going to wait for it for this training. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. But then the video would be embedded right here inside of the announcement. They could watch the video without going outside to YouTube. And that's just one way that we can encourage students to be involved and present and interact with um, the announcements and the videos. All right. That's a little bit about it, the announcements here. So uh, one last thing at the bottom of your settings, there is an option to enable a podcast feed. And I have uh, worked, this is my eighth college I have been at, and this institution um, has really seen tremendous growth compared to all of the other institutions I've been in with podcasts. Our students really do uh, enjoy podcasts. And by enabling that, this announcement becomes an RSS feed to um, Podbean or any of their subscription services that they use, and they can get a notification through their um, podcast service that there's a new announcement. So by enabling that, you're just in allowing students that want to participate by receiving an additional notification to have that opportunity. It doesn't have any other visual effect. It's just uh, a, good, a good way to reach uh, students in a different way that meets their need. All right, let me go ahead and save this announcement, even though there isn't anything in it. We'll just cancel, I guess. Another way that you can create recurring interactions is through the grade book. Let's pop over to the grades for a moment. If you were to hover over any of um, your assignments in the gradebook, there's a really neat feature called Message Students Who. And this is a new feature that Canvas implemented, I would say maybe two semesters ago. It's still fairly new. By selecting Message Students Who, you can choose to message students who have not yet submitted the assignment. Uh, perhaps it hasn't been graded yet. You can message students who scored more than a certain percentage or less than, 
or if they've been reassigned. So if I choose scored less than, I could put in less than 60%. And I can send the message to students, all of my students, I would check that. And then I could send a quick message directly from the gradebook and hit send. You can also attach a file or upload a video or an audio to make it even more personal. By messaging students who have yet to submit an upcoming assignment, you're really creating more instructor feedback and recurring interactions that's really meeting the students. And remember, you don't just have to email students who score less than. There's options to also congratulate and encourage those who scored more than maybe subtle reminders who haven't submitted it yet, or just a a note that maybe you're running behind on your grading uh, and you're working on getting that submitted. So those that you haven't graded yet, you could send a little quick reminder that you'll be submitting your grades by a certain date and time. That's in the grade book. You can hover over any of your assignments and select message students who. It's a great feature. Another feature that our students are using, in fact, over 85% of our students reported on the teaching and learning survey for 2022 that they have downloaded the Canvas mobile app. If you haven't done so, there is a great tool on your cell phones that you can use both on Android, Apple, and Google. It's the Canvas app. There's one for teachers and there's one for students. And our students will... um, use that app to often check grades, uh, check their inbox messages, um, send messages, as well as even submitting assignments. And faculty can do the same. They can use the app to grade and reply to students. It's very easy to do. And I enjoy using uh, the Canvas app because you can create announcements and record a quick video on your phone. I have done that so many times when I'm on the road traveling or perhaps um, I have made a mistake in the class and I'm getting some emails back on a missed deadline and I can send a quick uh, announcement to reassure everyone uh, that, you know, everything is fine and I will accept a late submission. Uh, So recording a video on your phone, it's not high quality, but it's a topic that we call humanizing the online experience, humanizing your online course, which really just makes it personal to the student and makes it feel as if they can connect to you. Humanizing online learning. So recurring interactions can be a great way uh, uh, for you to create instructor presence. Let's move on to number two. Let's talk about discussions. We all use discussions in our online class, or at least I hope you do. Years ago, when I went through my master's of instructional design, they were almost requiring us to do two discussions, two to three discussion forums a week. That has backed down a little bit. Our design strategies have um, now recommended one to two every week. Uh, and, And that's just to ensure rigor in our course and that our students are communicating with each other. But how they communicate in a discussion Um, is really in uh, the age-old debate of instructor engagement within student discussion forums. Yep, those uh, forums are meant for student conversations about new concepts. So remember that um, I was talking about Patrick Lowenthal at Boise State uh, University, and I shared with you his three uh, instructor presence identification of uh, cognitive Uh, social, and teaching presence, those three types of presence. But there's also, on the student side, presence as well. You have student-to-student interaction. You have student-to-content interaction. And then you also have student-to-instructor interaction. Three different ways that students should be interacting in a course in every module. So how do we do that? Well, we can use discussions for that. And still, an instructor presence or guidance, rather, is essential to promote critical thinking and correct misunderstandings and encourage connections. Now, beyond academic um, discussions, you can create a space and a discussion for informal opportunities as well. 
um, years ago, one of the first online classes I took, they had what we called a water cooler. And it was a discussion forum where you could essentially go up to and ask questions, kind of think of it as in the workplace, that water cooler where everybody goes and you see each other, maybe not so relevant today. You could call it the cyber cafe or just uh, something simple like get your questions answered here. Uh, But this informal location is uh, great for students to ask questions that they normally would ask in a face-to-face environment. Again, I want to encourage that you can use audio and video tools built right into Canvas for discussions. This is really a a much more beneficial way uh, for students to interact. So I'm in a sample module here, and I do have a sample discussion that I've got created. I'm going to go ahead and go into this discussion just to show you what it may look like. Let me um, edit this discussion. This is the new discussion view. This view is going to change next semester. Everyone will have this view. They've changed uh, the settings. Canvas has changed the settings in the kind of the overall look of discussions inside of Canvas. And we're allowing faculty to choose if they want that new look right now. But next semester, it will be uh, it'll look like this for everybody. So if you haven't had a chance to get in, get a good look at the new discussion uh, format, this is what it what it looks like. There is a rich content editor, which is the same editor that you have seen throughout Canvas. And then at the bottom, you have some additional features that we haven't had before for discussions. For example, if you want an anonymous discussion, you have options uh, for off, partial, or full. You also have the option to turn that podcast feed feature on. This works exactly the same way as it does in announcements. And then you can make it graded as well. There's also a feature called group discussion uh, that you can have. And by adding a group discussion, then you can select particular students to be assigned in a group or they can self-elect. That could be helpful if it's low stakes, more of a formative type of assessment, and you just want to have more of an informal opportunity to get that student to student interaction that we talked about. There's, um, in addition, there is a peer review feature. If you haven't used peer reviews before, this is a way for students to give critical feedback to other students on the quality of their submission. I don't see it very often for discussions. I see it a lot for papers, research projects, but usually um, not very often for discussions. So if you wanted to provide Uh, video feedback or uh, video announcements or video discussions, you would do it all the same way as I had shared with you earlier. Let me just replace this text here. I would put in a title. And then you have on the rich content editor, you have that same Yuja tool that I shared with you earlier. So in this discussion, you can select Yuja. You can record your own video. You can also uh, add a video from YouTube, as I showed uh, earlier, or you can attach a document, or you can get a 504 gateway timeout. It appears as if we're getting here, so let me close that out. Our internet's a little slow here on, on campus today, but the Yuja editor is right here, and you can uh, locate that record and upload media content. We encourage that our students are reporting that uh, the video and the audio is is helpful to them. And so we are um, encouraging more audio and video in discussions. Remember that it doesn't necessarily um, matter how students demonstrate mastery and understanding, uh, giving them a choice of how they want to demonstrate mastery is really encouraged. It's also important that you provide the directions to students. If they choose to do a video, are you providing a tutorial to students on how to do that? We have a lot of resources already built in that you can point them to, uh, but providing a tutorial to students so they know how to use Yuja would be a great um, addition to your discussion board introduction 
post here. All right, let me go ahead and close out of this and we'll move on to number three, which is prompt feedback. Think about how much time it takes you to provide feedback to your students. In our Quality Matters Assurance model that we use here at Heartland, quality feedback, prompt feedback is with anywhere between 24 and 48 hours. In an online class, it's especially important to provide prompt feedback. This is how our students are retained in an online class. The more you interact with them, the more they will give back to you. Um, there are quite a few research articles out there, especially under Achieving the Dream. If you follow Achieving the Dream, you can go out here and, and look at the newest research articles on uh, communication in an online environment, but tons and tons of research that support that, that prompt feedback uh, provides opportunities for student success. And multimedia can also be provided to students instead of written comments. I provide uh, written um, and verbal feedback to all of my students. In fact, I record it using Zoom and I pause uh, when I'm done with one student's paper. I share my screen. I show the student's paper and I'm talking through my feedback and recording my voice and my face and their paper at the same time. When I'm done, I hit pause, I bring up the next student, I unpause and I continue again until all my students are done. And then I have separate video clips that I just upload directly to the Canvas feedback page. That video feedback has been tremendous for students to be able to not only see their paper, but hear your tone and the feedback that you're giving is really instrumental to their success. And I'll show you some examples of that here in a few minutes. In the speed grader, there are options for you to provide uh, video feedback. Let me go into one of our assignments. And again, this is just a sandbox, so there isn't any particularly um, real content here. But let me find an assignment that I can show you what speed grader looks like. Also, if you're using Chrome, as your internet browser, there is a speech, uh, excuse me, there is a speech to text tool that you can use and it will uh, transcribe them into written comments for you. I've used that a time or two as well. I go into this assignment. Now remember, I don't have any student submissions here, but I just wanted to show you the process. If you wanted to use multimedia as a, a feedback comment in the speed grader. Both of the tools to provide feedback can be found in the comment box on each assignment uh, that you have within Canvas. The polls up here. Our internet is super slow today. Still loading. Let's try if we can go in a different way. We apologize. It seems as if our connection is a little slow. Now we'll go ahead and load that. We may come back to it if it's not going to load for us. All right. Well, we will come back to that. I'm unable to show that. It seems like it's taking a while to load. When you go into your assignments over on the right-hand side, there's a speed grader option. And um, within that speed grader, there is a comment box. And there's a small little media option that allows you to upload a media file, or you can just copy paste a link. If you used Zoom, uh, you can certainly um, use that as well. So let's see, it's taken a while to load. So we'll just move along, that's okay. All right, uh, there is an instructor calendar. I'm not sure if you use the calendar tool very often, but it is a great tool to help you keep uh, yourself 
abreast of when due dates are happening for yourself. That's what this calendar feature is over on the left. And you'll notice uh, on the right, I have a listing of all of my courses that I'm teaching. If I wanted to see due dates, for example, for one of the courses, I just click the little checkbox to show uh, due dates that are upcoming. But there is a calendar called your name. So if I go ahead and select that, you can create events by choosing this new event tool, and you can create a little reminder to yourself, like, uh, don't forget to give feedback for assignment two. And you can put in a date, and then just be sure that you're adding it to your own calendar. By doing that, then you're creating a, an item on your to-do list that reminds you of when you need to provide prop feedback. So I wasn't sure if you're familiar with the instructor calendar, but every faculty member has an instructor calendar and you can add an agenda. You can look at the month or the week of you and all you'll need to do is just create an event. There are some additional options. If you go to more options, you can actually add videos, hyperlinks, uh, Zoom links. Uh, there's a lot of neat features that you can add here. So the instructor calendar is a great way to keep yourself accountable or garner an appreciation for your students' weekly workload because that's what they see as well. Rubrics uh, is another great way to provide student feedback promptly. And um, I know last week we had a session on assessment strategies and we shared how to create rubrics, but I wanted to mention that rubrics also provide an opportunity for you to um, add comments and um, also uh, expand on each of the criteria. And I love rubrics because they create uh, for students an unbiased approach to grading. So instructors can use the rubric to provide clear feedback in a timely manner. And that way all students are held to the same clear standards for gradings. Okay, let's move on to number four. Let's talk about real world connections. You know, the ultimate answer, as I mentioned before, why is this important? This motivational barrier really can be solved by using real world scenarios. Students wanna know the three Ms. How is this assignment meaningful to me? Can I measure this assignment? And is it manageable? The three Ms. When I create assignments, I try to think of those three Ms and think of the student's perspective as they are completing this assignment. Is this really meaningful to them? Zach Petrie in the UDL class often refers uh, to an example that he tried to help his daughter understand a geometry, some math concepts that she was learning in middle school. And he thought he was doing a good thing. Uh, they were getting new carpet, carpet for their house and he took her to the carpet store and uh, they did a measurement of the room. And uh, I mean, uh, he thought he, his heart was in a good place and he was really wanting to use that as a teaching moment. However, I'm sure that every 13 year old girl uh, truly enjoys installing carpet in a house. So it really wasn't very meaningful to her, right? Uh, so we often talk about how we can choose assessments and assignments that are really meaningful to students. And that's why UDL is so important, giving students a choice and how they can demonstrate that mastery. So creating a connection really provides purpose, real world interaction and engaging content. Uh, theme related like current events are useful. Uh, when an instructor would like to adjust instructional material without perhaps changing curriculum and learning objectives. So technology can also work for that. Uh, in fact, I think the real world connection piece, you can use technology more so than any other. So we mentioned RSS feeds or rich site summary or really simple syndication is what that's called. You can feed that into the announcement tool so you can get web content into your course, right? <clears throat> this way students can stay informed of the most recent events and the sites that you select. It's really an ultimate time saver too, so you don't have to visit all those sites independently. Um, guest into your class is also an incredible way to add rich real world connections. 
Every week, I have a synchronous opportunity with my students. Every evening, it's optional. It's optional. You don't have to choose to come. In fact, the first couple of weeks, I didn't have anybody. I recorded it. And as soon as they saw what we were doing, I started to get more and more people attend. And now, um, I almost everyone is able to attend or at least watch the recording if they can't. So here's an example of one of my own classes, and this was recorded a while back, so I may not look exactly like this, but I wanted to play just a clip of this. You can see an interaction between a guest and I that I'm having in my class. Here are tools that we have for accessibility, so feel free to use them uh, if you'd like this evening. And before we jump into our conversation, does anyone have any questions regarding our uh, discussion board topics on grants and conferences and workshops? Any questions related to that? I've really gotten um, a kick out of a lot of the resources you've shared. And I thought what I would do is document all of those in one Google Drive document and share that out. So then you'll have all of those grant resources and all of those workshops in one place. So you don't always have to go back to Moodle to remember what a, a colleague had said or a mentor had said. So I'll do that uh, next week and share that out with everyone. Um, so uh, if there's no questions, right? I'm not hearing any, any questions. Okay. Um, this meeting will be recorded, so I'll share it out if you'd like to watch it again. Uh, but tonight, I am very, very excited to have my friend, uh, Tina Parskell, joining us from Colorado Community Colleges Online. And I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell her a little bit about her background. Uh, but as my guest, uh, I do these sessions with my classes over the years, and I just absolutely love having informal dialogue where we can all just hear what we're going through and what are some challenges and areas that we're excited about? And we have a lot to talk about with COVID and uh, the pandemic. There's a, there's a lot going on. So Tina, would you mind introducing yourself to my students? You bet. Well, thank you again for having me. It's nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Tina Perskell. So I just wanna stop here just for a second. So as I'm introducing uh, my guests, there's a couple of things I wanted to to pinpoint on. I mentioned putting everything in a Google Drive. It's good that you take learning outside of the LMS too, because the LMS is only good for as long as the instruction lives, right? And as after the class is over, how, how are they going to continue to utilize these resources? So sometimes what I'll do is I'll recap what are some of the top things that were said in a discussion forum for this week. And you'll hear me say, uh, I've taken all of these top ideas and I'm putting them into a Google Drive or Padlet. So here's what I've done for an, a course I'm teaching uh, this past couple of months. It was an informal learning class. And these are some guest presenters I've had. And then there's also some discussion topics, but Padlet's free. And uh, all I've done is just, if they've provided a website uh, resource. I've just added that resource here on Padlet so they can still have access to it. One of the great things with Padlet is that uh, if you don't want this visual format, there's a way that you can share this into um, a PDF. If I save this as a PDF, <clears throat> let me just show you what it looks like. If you were to move your discussions to a Padlet, look how simple this is. It will put everything into a text-based format without any graphics, so it makes it really accessible. Let me grab it over here. It's on my other screen on over here. And so uh, now you can see all of these great hyperlinks that my students have shared with each other in a discussion forum. And now it's in a tangible format that I can uh, just print directly from Padlet. I can share it as a PDF. It's completely accessible. And even though they may not have access to Moodle or the LMS or Canvas or whatever learning environment we're in, they will always have access to this. So that's another way that you can create real world experiences in a meaningful way. Uh, and this is a free tool. So all you do is create the little plus sign down here and you can put in a subject And 
And then you can add a picture, a document, a hyperlink, anything you want, really. There's tons of things that you can add. You just paste that in there and then you click publish and that comes here on this screen and then you can color code them. You can attach them to things. It's a really fabulous tool. And I have found that a lot of students uh, will use this in their learning and it's a great way to do that. So that's one thing that I have mentioned. Also during these guest presenters, now Dr. Tina Parskol is the chancellor of community colleges online in Colorado, lovely person. Uh, but during her presentation and while we're having this informal conversation, she and I, Padlet is up. And so students are sharing resources they're hearing in the background. We have a back channel now that's happening. Instead of a hashtag on Twitter, we're using Padlet to create additional experiences. So learning is constantly happening even during the, the session. And when you have a guest Try not to think of it as a presentation. Think of it as a conversation. Uh, it really intrigues students when they can listen to your conversation that you're having back and forth with somebody. And in this clip, um, you'll hear me ask a question and you can hear that informal nature of communicating back and forth. Um, assignments that we have coming up next week is to actually uh, connect with experts in the field. So don't be surprised if you get a lot of LinkedIn requests next week from our, my students tonight because they're going to want to connect with you on LinkedIn. But So again, informal, it's humanizing, it's connecting students to experts in the field and allowing them to feel empowered and you're humanizing that experience for them. So asking some folks that are in the field to come have a conversation with you and then inviting your students in to listen in and participate is a great way to create real world communication. And I try to do one a week. Sometimes it's hard to find guest speakers every week. Sometimes they cancel or, or whatnot, but um, I try to have one at least uh, every time we meet. And we have a seven-week class. So for a 16-week class, if you did a bi-weekly, I think that would be really exciting. This is another guest presenter I had, and she um, uh, is a missionary and uh, created uh, some robotics for uh, students or children with autism. And in this um, session, she talked about her experiences in Guatemala and her experiences um, uh, working with students in artificial intelligence and how she's helped in the autism field. So very meaningful. And uh, just reach out to people. You can find lots of people in your field uh, various ways that are hungry to share their stories. And this was probably one of the most impactful uh, presentations or guest presenters I've had. Um, and I had every student attend that session. So it's very exciting. Uh, so those can be recorded and shared over and over again. And I wanted to just highlight the importance of, you know, linking a real world guest presenter into your class that can make those connections for you. Uh, you can also create Google alerts as well to create those real world interactions. Let's move on to number five, our last item of creating instructor presence in an online class, and that's visual and audio communications. Now listen, online learning has come um, a far a distance from text heavy correspondence beginnings. Uh, remember the days when they would send you a videotape, you'd have to watch it and then take a test and send the videotape back. <laughs> Just like an in-person course gives the instructor a chance you know, to express insights and connections and concepts, you know, lots of technology has also provided opportunities for you to create interactions in your online classes as well. You know, at the beginning of the course, students answered, you know, what, what, what's the best time of day that's gonna work for you? And then they would give a live web conference leak uh, out into a class, but now students are really looking for just in time or JIT type of learning situations where they can watch the learning on the go. And that's why we recommend three to five minute video sequences um, that really can capture the student's attention in a small amount of time. A 50 minute lecture just isn't going to do it for our students. Um, and your videos need to be meaningful in a way that uh, can be segmented out by concepts. And I, 
I like to tell faculty to record short three to five minute videos on concepts in the week that are hard to grasp, that students really struggle with. There's no reason to record a 50 minute lecture video on concepts that students can read about. You'll know what your students are struggling with because you've been involved with the interaction from day one. So you, you can get an, a gist of what they're really having a hard time understanding. So each week, recording a short three to five minute video on those concepts will really help students interact. Uh, three to five minutes is kind of the golden length of time that we like to strive for for any video. Any longer than that, students' attention just isn't there. If you can't get it in a three to five minute video, then chunk it out. There's no reason why you can't have more than one video, but keeping a three to five uh, minute video is really ideal. An additional thing that we have recommended, and I know I've mentioned Yuja a time or two, but on any of your videos that you have created, let me just happen to go here to one of my own personal videos. One thing that you can do, let me come back here. Over here on the right, if you click on more on any of your Yuja videos that you've imported in, you have an option to create a quiz. You can create a video quiz right over the top of a video. And while you may not want to make it worth any points, some of the options you have in creating quizzes is um, adding a question that allows for a reflective pause, right? So you could pose a question in your video and then have a reflective pause so they have a chance to think about what's being said. Sometimes when we get hung up with videos, we forget to really apply what's being said in the video to our own understanding. So the reflective pause could be really helpful for students. In addition, Yuja has an option called decision points. And a decision point could be, um, do, do you understand this concept? If yes, then you could jump to a particular part of the video. If no, you could jump to another part of the video. So now you're really focusing in on the student-focused learning, student-centered learning, and you're applying the learning to how it impacts them. That's how you can be present in an online class without actually being present. You're creating opportunities for students to get the learning when they need it and how they need it without you actually being there in the classroom. Having these decision points and reflective pauses is a great way for them just to do a self-check. These are formative. In no means should these be a summative, high-stakes assessment. This is a self-reflection. It's a self-assessment on their own skills if they feel like they understand or they don't understand. So if they did get the concept, perhaps they jump from the one-minute mark to the four-minute mark where they're learning about new concepts that they haven't been introduced to. If they didn't get the concept, perhaps they jump from the one-minute mark right on to the next and they start learning about some remedial content that could help them understand it in a different way, in a different way, because they're not getting it in the way that you've showed it to them. So how can you show it differently? So that's how video could be used as a way to create that instructor presence. Um, Zoom is also a very highly effective tool for web conferencing. We mentioned that for video and audio communication. We do have Zoom embedded into Canvas on the left-hand side on the navigation bar. Zoom is available for you to create a scheduled meeting and everyone would uh, get that announcement in your course. You could also just use the same handle for your meetings over and over again. Mine is a Catterson. You can customize that by going to heartland.zoom.us and you can make your own handle and then they could pop into your Zoom room at any time. And having that routine um, meeting space where they know where to go can be especially important. If you'd rather not uh, use video, we would encourage you to record your lecture or short minute videos using Audacity, which is a free tool. We also have Camtasia and other podcasting <clears throat> recording equipment for you to record audio files. Uh, audio files are just as popular as video. In fact, sometimes I feel here in the TLC that they're even more popular. We have two podcast studios here and our students are really taking advantage of that. 
So a podcast for your class could also be an important video uh, audio tool. Uh, Remember, it's not one size fits all. You have to find the tools that work for you. Uh, Good teaching is good teaching. The technology can help with that, uh, but the learning outcomes and the objectives will still remain. So even though we have a plethora of tools, it's still focused on the content and you need to choose the tool that's comfortable for you. You don't have to choose something that you're not comfortable with. Start with something small and find a tool that you know, will help you interact with your students, both at a social level, a cognitive level, and a teaching level. This recording will be posted to our blog, heartland-online.blogspot. Let me pop that up so you have access to it. If you haven't been to our blog, we encourage you to check it out. We have lots of great discussions uh, and resources here for you. Also, we have a new YouTube channel, so you definitely want to check that out. You can find it on YouTube, Heartland Community College, and then look for the TLC channel. We'll share this video by the end of the week. And as always, if you have any questions or uh, comments, feel free to send us a note at anna.catterson at heartland.edu. Thanks for joining me today.